Hi, I'm Paul Sullivan, your host on the Company of Dads podcast. Today, our guest is Rob Taylor, founder of Dads in Business, a UK-based consultancy that supports fathers at work. Its focus is on the unique pressures that fathers face in the workplace, namely to keep working and to stomach the stress or conflict they might feel at home. Rob's background is in digital marketing, and he is a father of three, eight, six, and four. Rob, so good to have you on the Company Dads podcast. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Paul. Thank you for uh, thank you for having me. It's a, a, this is great to meet you. Uh, really looking forward to our chat, and uh, thanks for having me along. So your background's in marketing. Uh, you started Dads in Business in 2019, which seems like prehistoric times right now. Um, what was the impetus for it? So, yeah, I mean, 2019 seems a long, long time ago, doesn't it? It's uh, a lot's changed, but I think if anything, it makes projects like the dads in business and, and the work that you do more, more pertinent. Cause I think the, the, the pressures continue to be there, if not manifest in different and new ways. So it's uh, it's a real interesting time to be a busy working dad. Um, I think my, uh, I, I guess spark for creating the space and the, and the network was to ultimately support myself. Um, I don't know about your, your own journey into becoming a dad, but in hindsight, I found it very difficult, I think, because I was, uh, I had my first kid when I was employed. I'm trying to do my timeline now. So I, I was in my last job when I, oh no, my second to last job when I first became a dad. And it was the old thing of over in the UK, you get two weeks off maternity leave, back to work. It's as if you've had a holiday. It's like, get back to work, go and do your thing. But I didn't realize the life changing impact that, that this had. Uh, I was 29 at the time, first in my social circle to have kids. I often say no one, they don't teach dad in school. Um, dad passed away when I was 20, so I didn't have any sort of point of reference to, to what becoming a dad meant. I just know you had to do everything brilliantly and be perfect at everything and be... Why do, you think, why, why, do you think every, why do you think you had to do everything brilliantly? What was the, the, the feeling? Cause... Because, because I think that's I think that's ingrained in what being a man is and therefore becoming a dad. You have to be very good at things. We, we revert to the stereotype things, you know. Over here, if you're not very good at DIY as a bloke, you get laughed at. Uh, I'm not very good at DIY, by the way. <laughs> uh, because there's things that you're, there's still stigmas exi existing, right? Yeah. So as I became a dad, I thought, well, what do I do with what do I do with this this human? I don't, I don't know what I'm doing, um, but I can't speak up. I can't say I don't know what I'm doing because it will almost show weakness and play back to stigmas and stereotypes of, oh, you're useless, that sort of thing. Um, so right. just, when, when, I, when, as you become a dad, once you're a father for a while, you realize everybody's bluffing and, and hmm. I'm not joking. I mean, everyone is really bluffing. Everybody is figuring it out on their own. I mean, I love your tagline that they don't teach dad in school. I don't know where they, they teach it, but I think the, hmm. the, the key thing is it's sort of like, you know, when you're in university or if you go to university, you're, you're, you're sitting in a giant lecture hall and it's your choice of, you know, kind of coasting along, uh, and getting what we would call over here in the States, a gentleman C or actually paying attention. And I think so much of, of fatherhood and, and being a good partner is, is paying attention. And, and, you know, my motto at least is, you know, don't make the same mistake twice. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm certainly going to make a ton of mistakes, but the problem becomes when you're repeating the same mistake over and over again and expecting a different, a different outcome. So, so you're a new dad, you're 29, your friends are still out there, um, having a blast. They don't understand why you're absolutely no fun and exhausted all the time, but you know, what was it about the workplace, not just the social space or the, or mm. the home space, but that the workplace that made you think, okay, I, I'm not quite get, they're not getting me or I'm not getting, you know, them and, and we need to, we need to change something. Yeah. It's an interesting one. Isn't it? I, mean, I think a big one in hindsight was the two weeks maternity leave is, it, it is as if you've got the holiday, but it wasn't until I guess fast forward in a couple of years when my second one was due, um, well not due, but my wife was pregnant with our second. So my firstborn was then two. So I had a two year old and a pregnant wife. Yeah. Uh, I got made redundant from my final employment. Uh, and that was a bit of a kicker. Um, so I thought, right, I'm going to, I'll set up shop on my own. Uh, yeah. I'm going to do this on my own because I'm better than this. And there's all those sort of macho, manly things playing out and I thought right this is me I'm going to do it on my own I didn't got a clue what that meant at the time but I knew I was, I was sick of being kicked around and it was my second redundancy so I was a bit tired of that and I thought I need to take responsibility for, for my family and look after that so I'm going to charge off and do it and 
again, I guess, I guess you defer back to those stereotypes. You know, what's the first question you ask when you meet someone in a networking session or a trade counter or wherever you bump into your professional community? Everyone always says, oh, are you busy? Yeah. Not, are oh, you happy? Are you successful? Are you content? Are you balanced? Are you busy? So, so in, that in, became... the, in, in the States, that question is, what do you do? And it's the same mm. three questions like, where are you from? Where'd you go to school? And and what do you do? And, and you know, the first two sort of fade away as you get older, but you could be in your 30s, 40s, 50s. Mm. What do you do? And that's a difficult question, you know, sometimes for men to, to answer. The company of dads, we, we call the men who are so the go-to parents, lead dads, you know, whether they mm. work full-time, part-time, or devote all their time to their kids. And one of the things we push for is, say you're a lead dad. Now, I'm just as guilty as this for, you know, 25 years as a journalist, you know, the majority of that time at the New York Times, I led with Paul Sullivan, New York Times columnist. I never led with Paul Sullivan, you know, lead dad. So how did you, you know, wrestle with that question of, you know, are you well, busy? Well, this is it, is it, is it? Do do? Yeah. Okay, so are you are you busy? Yes, I'm very busy. Great. Yeah, How busy. busy? Of course I'm very busy. Uh, and, that, and that became well, like, yeah, what are you busy doing? Like I'm very yeah, busy. Yeah, I've got two yeah, yeah. two kids, my wife's recovering from from giving yeah. birth and it's a it's a you know total But you don't show. mention that. It's like how busy I am. I'm really busy at work. But no one mentions is the time that you're spending at work productive, profitable, yeah, yeah. a good investment of time. Yeah. So I took that role as me. I self-identified as the breadwinner, the one who's gonna go and provide my decision to go work for myself, I'm going to not stop until I do that. Yeah. But I was going to like networking sessions or meetings at like eight, nine at night that offered no benefit or return on investment going back. But I was busy. And well, while, you're, while your wife is home with, with, yes. you, yeah, yeah, with, with, yeah. with the young one and, and, and pregnant. So I was, I was charging ahead saying, this is what I should be doing. This is what busy looks like. This is what a provider looks like. And I thought, well, hang on. I can't remember where or when I was, but. I just remember thinking, if I'm saying yes to this over here, yeah. I haven't realized it yet, but I'm actually saying no to the things that I set out to look after in the first place. Sure. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm not going to be home for dinner time. No, I'm not going to be home for bedtime. No, I'm not going to be home for bath time because I'm busy. Mm -hmm. And I just think we see a lot of dads who fall into this role because like you say, you know, what do you do? That intrinsically suggests back to a professional role. What do you do to make money? Yeah. Not, not what do you do in terms of your family? It's what do you do? No, like you said, you defer back to, um, was it finan uh, Financial Times columnist? Yeah, the New York Times, yeah. New yeah. York Times yeah. columnist, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's what I do. And no one ever says, like, you know, I'm a lead dad, I'm a stay-at-home dad, I'm a primary caregiving dad. Um, I mean, I wasn't that, and I'm still not, but I, I, I do find the balance a lot better now. Yeah. So, you know, I, I found that sort of question playing around in my mind, but then I found there was nowhere to go to raise that. You know, if I'm saying yes to everything at work, to get busy at work, to, but I'm saying no to my family that pulls and makes me feel guilty and yeah. uh, has me juggling many plates, where can I go to sort that out and raise it? Not from like it's a huge, the wheels have come off mental health problem, but just to have a chat. Yeah. Just to have a space of similar people to, to find another father in a similar situation as you, either in the same or or, or, or even, I think even better, like a couple of years down the road, who has a little bit of experience to sort of share mm. with you. Yeah, exactly. Because if I go to a, a work event and people say, "How's work?" Really busy. Yeah. If I go home, bear in mind my position here was a self-employed, trying to figure out how to pay next yeah. month's bills. I didn't want to worry the wife. I'd go yeah. home and she'd say, "How's work?" Really good. Busy. Very yeah, busy. busy. Like the Even if internally, been. I'd had a really bad week. <laughs> yeah, the, the the kid at home was crying. I was knackered. Work had to be good. Yeah. Home had to be good. Yeah, you go to the pub with your friends. You talk about football, sports, lad stuff. They don't want to hear that you've been up four times at night or you've not slept or your know, work. You lost that one deal at work that's going to make you struggle next month. So there's nowhere to go. So I think as, as dad, we internalize this. And I don't know what your experiences are of, of, of this in the company of dad's work that you do, but we seem to internalize that and we keep sweeping things under the carpet mm -hmm. and we don't really understand our own definition of what good looks like. What's a good enough dad yeah. in the role yeah, yeah. that I play? And how do we define that? When they don't teach it in school, we barely speak to our partners at home about it. We just defer back to stigmas and stereotypes, which play into us feeling more guilt. Yep. So it's a bit of a vicious circle. I mean, does, does that play out in what you've seen as well, Paul? 
Well, I found the the biggest thing with the company of dads is, is when we get together as, as, as lead dads, either in you know small groups or, or online, whatever our background is that we come together as, as lead dads. I've done the work and in, in the U S there are about 20, 25 million men who would qualify as lead dads out of 125 million men in America. And so, suddenly, and, and there are 75 million dads. So it's a, you know, a little less than a third of the dads. Um, and there's this sense of of relief. And I tell this story where um, there's a guy I did a podcast with named, named J.R. Havlin. He's a comedy writer. He's very successful. Um, and he's a lead dad. And we play golf um, on a Tuesday uh, over the summer, which is a perfect day because, you know, we're not playing on a weekend because we're, we're trying to be good fathers and, and partners. And we're not taking off for five hours on a Saturday. And it was probably the first time where I was playing with somebody and I didn't have to worry that something might come up um, family wise, because if something came up for him, family wise, totally understand. If something came up for me, family wise, he would totally understand. And we talked about it when we finally got out there and it was wildly enjoyable because why we were, we were honest. We weren't, you know, former New York times columnist or, or Emmy award winning comedy writer. We were two men who were lead dads who were embracing this role of, of not just being, you know, the go-to parent, but also trying to support our spouses in, in their, endeavors and it was a relief and that was you know as i've seen across the network it doesn't matter what your background is if you're stepping forward as a lead dad you suddenly have a point of contact whether you uh work in it uh or you're uh an nfl uh football player who won a a, a super bowl and i have you know both those guys or you're a journalist down in baltimore you, you suddenly come together and, and that was the goal of the company dads and, and you know it's fortunate that it's working but i want to ask you like when you get together, you, you go into companies and you've gone into a bunch of companies or you get together, you know, guys, so your network, do they have that same sense of, of relief when they come to a dad's in business event or the same ability to be uh, open about, you know, what they're, what they're trying to balance, what they're trying to do. Mm. No, that's a good question. And I think the, they come into it almost with a sense of curiosity or intrigue, I think. Uh, and they leave, with some of the words you mentioned, they leave with a sense of relief. Yeah. Um, we've had feedback before saying it's quite cathartic um, because I don't, you know, I don't know about yourself or your listeners. If I have, let's broadly call this a well-being brand, you know, we're, we're there to support uh, a bunch of dads to help make themselves a bit a bit better at home and work. If that was a generic workplace well-being session that was open to all, yeah. personally, I wouldn't engage it. Mm. Because it's not for me. Yeah, you know, an, an example: we went to um, antenatal classes. You know, before you're a parent, you yeah. go up to the hospital, uh, and they talk about all sorts of things. But those all sorts of things are all geared towards the mom and yeah. the birth yeah. and the immediate afterbirth and what the mom's going to be doing. Yeah. I remember I went up to our local hospital. I'm pointing over there because it's about half a mile up there. Yeah. Um, and they, they tried to show me how to breastfeed. And I was thinking, well, this is just completely impractical. Mm. What can I do? What can I actually do? Yeah, yeah. give me a task not... that I can accomplish. And feel yeah. Like it. yeah, yeah, give me something that's got a beginning and an end, and I'll go and own that space. But it didn't exist. So again, it played back into that thing of there's nowhere for a, a new dad to turn. So when we go into organization and we start talking about you know, how to have better conversations with the kids, how to manage guilt, how to check in with overwhelm or anxiety, how to stay focused and balanced across the four areas that, that we think make dad. You know, you've got your yeah. work life, you've got your money life, your yeah. Um, yeah. family life, and yourself. Because nine times out of ten, it's the self that goes first. Mm -hmm. And then we get distracted from our family, but then we start just focusing on work because it's our goal to get money. So, well, But also work is not that it's easier, but it's, it's uh, more tangible. Like, okay, mm. I'm going to put more hours in, or I'm going to try to do this deal, or I'm going to try to, you know, write more stories in, in, in my case versus self-care. And I guess, you know, to be fair to listeners, I mean, obviously working moms have the same, same problem mm. around self-care, like to take time off and to say, I'm going to go out and, and, and do this. And it's funny last night, um, you know, the holiday, we're talking before the holidays. Um, I went out and, and met my good friend uh, for two hours and we had, uh, you know, two drinks and I had a bowl of soup and it was great. And then I went home and my daughters, I put my daughters to bed, but, but I had to sort of schedule that time because if you don't do that, it just steamrolls on you. Mm -hmm. 
Is no, that, is absolutely. That what you're it does. Because uh, you, know, you might hear it yourself where you speak to your network in the company of dads there that they, they say things like, I used to enjoy that. Yeah. I remember when. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't it good when we did this. But, but it also why? becomes like if somebody is doing something uh, that you wish you were doing, I find it can become spiteful. Like, oh, that must be nice. It must be nice that you're able to do that. Oh, wow. Yeah. I guess you're not working very hard. Or are you, you know, are you retired? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't you, have time for that. How do you have time for that when I'm so busy yeah. at work and then back with my kids? But you don't realize the damage that you're doing to yourself by neglecting yourself. You know, you can't bring the best of you to your family if you've neglected your social side or your hobby or something that's just for you that's not work related or there to drive revenue. Yeah. And I think it's something that's really important but gets forgotten because we are busy. Mm -hmm. One of the things I advocate, and I'd like to know what you do on, on your end, is is almost a, a sort of rigid, you know, calendaring type process, like scheduling things out, but being super transparent. Like, you know, my calendar will show my wife what I'm doing. My calendar will show people at work uh, what what I'm doing. And it's, it's very open. There, there's very few things, unless it's like a surprise for one of my daughters that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want them to see it on their phone. And, 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 and to sort of, it, it takes a lot, it takes a bit of work to, to block things out uh, well in advance, but in doing that, it guarantees that you have, you know, time for your family, uh, time for work, but also time, as you call it, time for yourself, time to, to, to mm. go out. And have, what do you advocate on, on your end for, for that? Uh, I think something, something quite similar. Um, however, when we speak to business owners, for example, they find it incredibly hard. We'll say to them, you know, we work with a bunch of tradespeople on, a, on another project that I work on. And that is the classic, how busy are you? How busy can you get? Yeah, and I'll say, what does your calendar look like next week or next month? And they'll basically just say, well, it's blank. So, so what if a customer phones up at eight o'clock on a Tuesday night? Right. I've got nothing on, so I'll, I'll go and see them. Like, well, think about what you're saying no to. So my, my colleague on that project, he's got, such, he's got such discipline around this. He'll say, well, take one colored pen, and we'll, we broke the, the week down into a grid. So you've got like a Monday, Tuesdays down the columns, then yeah. down the rows we have early a.m., mid a.m., lunchtime, and so on and so on through to the evening. So it's about six rows, seven columns. He says, take one colored pen. Say it's blue. He says, in blue, scribble out some boxes. This is your family time. Mm -hmm. This is your school pickup on a Wednesday afternoon. This is your football practice with the kids. This is your swimming lesson. Put those in first. And they, they look a bit shocked because <laughs> yeah. they don't like doing it. Then he says, right, pick up another pen. This is for you. This is your hobby time, your gym time. This might be early in the morning, whatever it is. And suddenly uh, the, the blank boxes in this calendar are getting less and less. Yeah. Then he's like, now circle the empty ones. But that's your work. Now you can work there. There's enough there for you to get done what it is you need mm -hmm. to get done. And if a customer phones you, in a blue box time, for example. Yeah. So I'm so sorry I can't get to you right now. My next available slot is Tuesday or Thursday mid-afternoon. Which one works for you? Yeah. And they've never lost work from it because a customer goes, oh, thanks, I'll take the yeah. Tuesday. We're still I'll giving choice. Yeah, yeah we're, still, we're still giving the sense of choice there. And yeah. I just think if we can be more disciplined around that and box off certain elements for each time, we'll realize that, hang on, there's enough to do everything. And I'm not being naive enough to say, this works 52 weeks of the year. There's seasonal sure. peaks, there's trends. We have to be grown up about that and say, well, if I give this time in the summer, I yeah. appreciate family and get agreement and expectations from the home. In winter, I'm going to have to be at work more. But it's an agreement and it's not a, a resentment or a, a butt in heads. Um, so it's, 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 I love this because it's, it's what I advocate as well. And one of the things I always round out by saying is that, look, if you were in a meeting with somebody else, if you were in a meeting with a client and another client called, would you put that phone down and say, oh, hang on, uh, here's the other client? Because by implication, you're saying that other person calling is is more important because you're taking his or her call and, and putting the other person. You would never do that because mm -hmm. you would not be long for your job if, if, if you did that. And I think of the same way, if you were doing something you know, for yourself, if you're doing something for your, your children, if you're doing something for your, your wife, uh, why not block that off and treat it the, the same way? And obviously there's balance here. You can't, you know, have a seven hour chunk of time blocked off every single day, but, but you know, every so often you can have that, that chunk of time and just to manage your calendar that way. And, and I find like the people I've worked with and myself, 
it helps to reduce the stress and it helps to sort of, you know, give definition because the joke is like, if you think you're working all the time, you're not really working all the time. You're just being inefficient mm-hmm. and you're, you're being distracted by stuff. I mean, you're watching like, you know, uh, cats wrestling on, on, on TikTok or, you know, uh, you know, puppies, uh, you know, sleeping on, on YouTube and, and which is fine. There's a place yeah. for that, but not, not wildly productive. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a there's a whole discipline piece around it, and I think the first step is almost an awareness to say you can choose. You, ha- you it, it is possible to manage your time. You know, I've got three young kids as as they're growing up, eight, six, four, as you said at, at time of recording. Their needs are getting more demanding. You know, we're doing swimming now with two of them. We're doing football with one of them. There was gymnastics with another one of them. There's a third one that's going to come up needing that as well. That all takes time. If I just left my diary open and blank and didn't do any sense of planning around that, yeah. it would just be like the Wild West. It would just be completely unmanageable. And I know critics of that sort of approach might say, it's your family, it's not work. You can't book your family in like you do work. Like, well, no, I agree that. But you have to, you do have to allocate time where yeah. I'm not working. It's non-work time. It's not family time where I'm boxing in an hour, sit down with my kid or whatever. It's just non-work time. Don't work then. Yeah. I, I find it, you know, before I did that, you know, before I'd figure this out, I, I, it would be very stressful because one of the things I now try to do when I'm with my family is to leave my phone uh, somewhere else. Because the idea is if I've committed this block of time to take my, you know, daughter to lacrosse and I want to watch her play lacrosse, well, I need to watch her. And if I sit there and I start looking down on my phone, well, the entire time, disappears and again like same for pretty much everybody uh somewhere around 80 percent 90 percent of of the the urgent emails we get are really not urgent Mm -hmm. and they can all be tended to right after and and my daughter's gotten used to we'll get in the car after lacrosse practice and i'll sit there for a second and i'll scan the emails and if there's one that is uh vitally important i will uh, respond which takes me about 30 seconds uh and then we go on with our day and we go home um Mm -hmm. but it but i had that moment to be present and i also think it's important it's important for us as, 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 as men for our mental space, but I think it's really important uh, for our kids because, you know, my kids are, are 5, 10, and 13. And if there's one thing I know 100% for sure, it's that they they may or may not be listening to what I'm saying, but they 100% are watching what I'm doing. And if there's any inconsistency between what I say and what I do, that's a red flag. But for the most part, they're modeling their behavior after what my wife and I are doing. So if we're, you know, constantly on our phone, distracted, be like, you know, and, and then we tell them, Hey, you've had too much screen time. They're going to like, well, what about you? You've had too much screen time. And my 13 year old says this all the time. And so it was like, I like think the, the, the beauty of, of modeling it. And so I'll ask you this when you're, you know, going into companies and I'm not sure what, what level you, your, your sweet spot is. We, we try to aim for sort of the employee resource groups and, and the middle managers, emerging leaders. But, but when you're talking to those people who are more in a, a management level. Um, what? What? How do you get buy-in from them? Are, are they? Do they realize the importance of, of modeling their own behavior for their? Yeah, I think work? they. Um, does that work? To be honest, I think they want. I, I think they want the help. So it's not about getting the buy-in. They realize that there's uh, things could be better. Uh, yeah. And and I'll never speak to anyone and say I'm perfect. Uh, and I think that's what helps get a bit of trust with organizations and, and certainly those that are attending. You know, I'm not, I'm just sharing my experiences and my stories. Do I ever go home and not check my emails? No, it's horrible. Yeah. I, I know when I'm doing it. I shouldn't be doing this. Yeah. My kids want to see me do something. And you're right. I loved your, your quote about the, um, they might not tell, they might not listen, but they'll definitely see. Yeah. I think that, and, and yeah, mine are 864. They might not be able to articulate, well, you're doing that. So why can't oh, yeah. I? But, but they'll just it do it. Yeah. yeah. And I can hear myself barking at them to say, get off your screens, get off your screens. And the second they do, I'm on my screen. So it's horrible. So we know we've got our own weaknesses. And I think those in organizations, those that run their own business, also know that they've got their own weaknesses. Mm-hmm. It's not about saying you need to do better. It's about are we happy with where we're at? Are we happy with this balance? You know, without doubt, when 2020 came through uh, and the pandemic came, work and home for a lot of people became the same space yeah so there was no physical distance 
you know, a lot of people didn't have home offices. They didn't have separate home offices. I had to, in the house I was living at the time, I had to set up a desk in our bedroom mm. to try and continue to make work happen or at least manage what could happen at work. Whilst my kids were downstairs, I could hear them screaming or fighting with each other or yeah. watching a bit of YouTube. So guilt started to play play out. And that's a very common thing that happened as well. We saw guilt rise. We saw anxiety rise. We've seen overwhelm rise because we're not addressing it. We're not speaking yeah. about it. We're just saying, I've got to get on with it. I've just got to get on with it. But we don't know what getting on with it is. Yeah, so I'm glad you, you get brought busy. that up because I, you, you know, you, you've done a lot of research on this and you have some interesting statistics around, you know, depression, around all these things. Talk a bit about, you know, what prompted that, that research, uh, what you found. And then, of course, you know, how, how do we act on it? Well, I think ultimately it was because I wanted to find out if it was just me. Right. You don't that, want to that, alone. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was the, um, that was the driver behind it. I think it was like, it, it was like, it can't just be me or is it just me? I need to find something else. So it's just very simple straw poll stuff that we do for, for organizations. You know? Do you feel more guilty now or less guilty now? Do you feel pulled apart? Do you feel you've got too many tasks? Are you waking up with guilt, with overwhelm? And the amount of times people say, yes, this is me. It, yeah. It's in, it's heartening. But it's also worrying, but it's quite heartening to see that it's not just. But it's heartening that they'll admit it and they'll talk about it, but it's worrying because you have so many people. Who exactly, exactly, thing. and I think there's the the creation of the space helps that to happen. You know, you're always giving permission for people to be open and, and remove the mask, as we say, uh, talk about, or, or even just listen to stories from others in their space. Yeah. Which say, oh, hang on, I didn't realize this, but that's what I do. I'm glad we can share now and we start to open that up and then we can start to share tools for managing it moving forward. Yeah. Now, I mean, sharing is obviously the, the, the first part and I don't want to put you on the spot here, um, but I will, um, you know, a, 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 after the, after the sharing, you know, do you have sort of, you know, concrete bits that you tell people like, okay, you guys are in the same boat here. This is how you continue the metaphor. Uh, uh, row that boat forward or get out of that boat. I mean, uh, uh, do you have sort of concrete, you know, sort of one, two, threes that you help people, you know, work? Yeah, through? so the, um, the first uh, sort of steps to delivery, if you like, is for a larger organization, for example, we'll go in with our, we call it the discovery session, which basically talk about the framing of why we're here, why I talk about dad's mental health is important, why yeah. male loneliness is rife, why male suicide's up, and all that sort of stuff to really help uh, not only men and dads, but the partners as well, and others in the organisations. Uh, we then that that's usually open to to the whole company, men, women, whatever. And and after that, we then open up a series of spaces just for dads, where we'll talk about the common themes. So we'll talk about anxiety. What is it? How it might show up. How you can start to manage it. Overwhelm. What is it? How it might show up. How you can start to manage it. Um, guilt another one uh, and then focus around the four areas that that we highlighted earlier business um life money and, and self because it's not until you have that awareness and i think it's a huge thing like we talked about yeah. with the time management thing once you're aware of it you can do something practical about it like we mentioned in the antenatal classes there was nothing practical for me to do so i didn't engage it yeah but as soon as i for example would become aware of my calendar and there's a practical way of managing that I can then decide to take ownership of it or not because then the responsibility comes to me. So it's not about preaching to people, mm. but it's about saying, here's what happened. Here's what, how it, or here's the, the headline theory around anxiety, what it is, definitions. Here's how it plays out for me as a working dad. Do you recognize yeah. this? Get some insight, share some polls. Great. Now here's some resources that you can take away. You can either read, you can watch, you can engage. Yep. You can do your own thing because I'm not a practitioner of that, but or I'm not a qualified practitioner. You're not a therapist, you're more. Yeah, of a coach. yeah, I'm not yeah. a therapist yeah. exactly. Yeah. But there's enough third party resources around there that have helped me that I think can help others. And the, yeah. my colleague on the project is more of a exec coach who is well studied, well versed, well qualified in this. And we bounce off each other with, "Here's my experiences of it, and yeah. here's what you can practically do to make it better." Um, you know, because they're never silver bullets. Um, I think accountability is key and that's something we need to start building out more and more, uh, which I think you have probably kind of 
captured that in your company of dads, right? Is the accountability piece. It's yeah. imperative. This has been uh, excellent, Rob. Thank you for being my guest today on the Company of Dads podcast. I always like to give the guests the last word and, and talk to me about this. You know, you, you're sort of three distinct periods, you know, 2019 pre-pandemic, you know, dads in business uh, in the UK, you know, goes through the pandemic. And now here we are in at least what we call in the United States, the next normal. You know, how do you look at um, the way businesses and and, and, and workers are going to work this this dance out going forward? Are you, you optimistic, pessimistic? Are you pragmatic? How do you see, you know, this, this, this new period working for, you know, fathers being, bringing their whole self to, to work? Mm. It's, I think a lot of it needs to come from leadership. And I think it, uh, there needs to be an awareness again, to go back to the awareness side of things. If companies got to where they are by doing what they've always done and expect that to deliver the results. I think that needs to change. Uh, as dads get younger and Gen Zs, millennials, Gen Zs, I'm a millennial at 38, just for those listening, if they need that reference, millennials and Gen Zs will expect different things of their employer. Mm -hmm. So I think as organizations see that hitting their recruitment where they can't get the best recruits because they want a better balance, where they see it hitting their revenue because the staff churn has gone through the roof, I think that will start to drive change because there's a there's a real push for, as there should be, uh, equality across the whole workplace. Absolutely. But that does have to include dads in that conversation. If we just say we need to get women more of the career ladder, equal pay, all valid points, not disputing that. But if you're then telling dads, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. As a dad, I'd imagine we might lock off, we might shut the doors, and we might not be open to equality at all yep. because I'm going to entrench my views and entrench what I'm doing. So we have to open it up on both sides, I think, to have a better a better discussion. Um, you know, Some of our research suggests that 44% of working dads in a management level and above of, see the perception of having young kids as, as a weakness to their career. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm not going to open up if I'm at risk. <laughs> we need to create that space to to not have that that risk. So I think it has to come from leadership. I think they need to create that space. But likewise, the new workforce, they're going to be choosing where they want to work with, who they want to work with, and how they want to work that satisfies that balance. So it's going to be interesting. And if we can start to play a part in that to help create that awareness, then happy days. I don't have all the answers, Paul, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but we're asking the right questions. Yeah, well, um, and that's the thing, isn't it? We've got to have, open it up and have conversations like this. Yeah. Rob Taylor, founder of Dads in Business. Thank you again for being my guest on the Company of Dads podcast. Thanks so much, Paul. Take care.